Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the KHLC Fanbase. Before we get into the interview, this will be very quick, I promise. I just want to say that this is not our content. This is re-uploaded from Adrian Beck, and his links will be down in the description below. This interview took place December 2nd of 2020. Make sure to like the video if you enjoy this type of content, and subscribe if you haven't already. And I hope you enjoy the video. Better Reading Kids live book event today featuring, as you can see, New York Times best-selling author, Shannon Messenger. Hooray! <laughs> now, Shannon's the creator of the Keeper of the Lost Cities series, behind which we'll discuss uh, further shortly. And Shannon will be answering all your questions. So please get involved at any time. She's happy to answer all your questions, but no spoilers. She's got a strict no spoilers policy, which I can totally understand. I'm children's author Adrian Beck, and I'm thrilled to be talking with Shannon. Shannon, thank you for joining Better Reading Kids. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is so cool that I get to be talking to people on the other side of the world while at home in the comfort of my own chair. It's, it's amazing. So, <laughs> it's very convenient. Uh, now, you are over in California at the moment, am I right? I am. Um, so I think my weather is somewhat similar to yours at this point in time. Um, is yeah. it it's warm there in Australia right now? Or? It is warm, actually. It's getting warmer. We're, we've just hit summer, actually. Okay, yeah. So California basically doesn't have seasons. So yeah, pretty similar. <laughs> Beautiful. Love it. Hey, thank you for joining us. We're going to talk to you about your awesome series. I've got them all piled up right here. They are the Keeper series, the Keeper of the Lost City series. There is eight books in the series at the moment, and they are going through the roof. Um, but there's <laughs> 8.5. We're going to get to 8.5 in a moment. But these are the first eight in the series. Uh, and I should remind everyone that um, if you have any questions for Shannon or about the series at all, just pop them, uh, shoot them through, and she'll answer any of your questions. So um, let us know if you've got any thoughts. But uh, the eight books so far, and then the mighty 8.5. <laughs> so I wonder if you could explain to us, maybe we should start at the beginning. Can you tell us a little bit more about the series in general, The Keeper of the Lost Cities? Yeah, um, so my quick pitch for the series has always been sort of Lord of the Rings meets X-Men. Oh, yes. um, kind of got, you know, fantasy creatures, um, especially elves and, and dwarves and goblins and all of those things. Um, but instead of sort of going the magical path, I went a little bit more of the sort of superhero, superpower kind of path. Um, and it's got a huge cast, just like how X-Men has, you know, <laughs> lots of different mutants. And each each character's got a different ability that makes them special in their own way. So we're following the, the story of Sophie Foster. She's 12 when we meet her. And yeah. she sort of has this ability to read minds. And she thinks it's because she fell and hit her head when she was tw five years old. Um, and then this mysterious and rather attractive boy <laughs> shows up on her class field trip and shows her that she actually belongs to this secret world called the Lost Cities. Amazing. And that they've been looking for her. And now that they've found her, that's where she needs to go be. And it's one of those things where it's very exciting because she finally gets to go where she really belongs. But it also I mean, she has to leave everything she's ever known behind and start over. Um, and, you know, just when she's starting to get used to that, she starts to wonder, okay, so wait a minute, why was I hidden away? Why didn't I know what I am? And I obviously don't want to spoil anything. So I'll just say that, you know, there's quite a lot of mysteries and secrets involving her. And she just, you know, kind of has to save the world. That's not a lot of pressure for a 12 year old, right? I mean, no. You totally could have done that when you were 12. I mean, I know I definitely could not, but <laughs> Sophie um, and her friends are up to the task. I think if we combined our powers, we might. I'd save it from Australia and you could save it from the US if you like. Uh, maybe sure. uh, that would have worked out okay. Hey, so you've got the eight book. It's an epic series. And as you've explained, it's a, it's a terrific fantasy series about a, a secret hidden world that sort of exists in parallel to our own world. And Sophie gets to uh, be a part of it, finds out she actually has has some very strong roots in that world. But um, there's 8.5, which has just come out, which is really exciting to me because I've never heard of a book which is 8.5 and 8 point, uh, like a half. It's kind of very <laughs> fun. And that is the mighty Unlocked here. You've got to, just so people can have a look yeah, at that. I have the, uh, the American edition, so. <laughs> yeah, the American edition right there, yes. Is that, does that differ much? Oh, it does differ slightly, yeah. Oh, it's a half. <laughs> How nice yeah, is it's that? a hardcover, and so yeah, that's. I think that's pretty much the only difference. I mean, they might have changed the spelling of certain words because I think um, 
Americans spell a few words differently than Australians, yeah. but yeah, it should be yeah. basically the same. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you've revolutionized. Because it's you... like a weapon, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're all pretty heavy, I've got to say. <laughs> they are. Yeah. My favorite is when I do signings and I see the kids that are holding the stack of the whole series and it's almost as tall as they are. It's just amazing. I'm like, see, I'm giving you a workout. I'm encouraging exercise. <laughs> been waiting in line all that time with all these stacks of books now 8.5 you've revolutionized how we count books which is amazing so well done um <laughs> this is almost like a little bit of a guide to the amazing world that you've created in the series is, is that fair to say yeah at least the the like the probably two-thirds of it is that and then the last third of it is um the continuation of the story yeah. um it basically it came about because i ran into a situation where I realized I kind of needed to break my own rules for the series. Um, all wow. of the other this up until this point are told third person, but limited to Sophie. So we don't see any scenes unless Sophie is in them. And okay. we don't get to hear anyone's thoughts except Sophie's. And again, trying to be careful about spoilers, um, I'll just say that because of something that happened at the end of book eight, I realized that in order to really properly tell the next piece of the story, I needed to be able to go into another character's POV for certain chapters. But I also knew that that device wasn't going to work for the entire book. And so I just kind of went to my editor, like, I don't know what to do. Do we tell the story in a lesser way? Or what do we do about this piece that's gonna be about 300, or I think it's about almost 250 pages of the next part of the story that needs to be told differently. And so that's kind of how Unlocked came to be was we decided to separate that piece out. And then um, because we had also known that there were so many things that readers were struggling to keep straight because it's such a complicated series and also just lots of questions about the way the world works and backstories on different characters and things like that. Information that I'm sure you know as a writer, there's like limits to how much you can really work into a book before it just yeah. starts to feel like info dump, you know? Yeah. And so there were all these questions about, you know, what is this character's ability and, and all of these things that it was just like, I don't know how to work that in in an organic way in the story. And so it was like, well, then let's make the other portion of this book a guide that sort of goes over everything we already know, but then also weaves a ton of new little tidbits and secrets in there. I've, I've gotten pictures of readers that have sort of been going through and like flagging with little post-it notes, all the different new pieces of information that yeah. you, there's a ton in there. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Um, I sort of dug through my old notebooks and was like, finally, I can reveal these things. So it's <laughs> it's kind of like a, 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 a the first half of the book is like a gift to fans of everything they've sort of been asking for and then and including art and some games and activities and all kinds of fun stuff. And then then the next part is the continuation of the story. And then, you know, things will go back to normal in book nine. So we have this weird little 8.5 thing that I'm doing, um, which is, I, I've had people say, but you realize it's still a ninth book. And I'm like, yes, but we're calling it 8.5. Go with me here, people. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Um, there's also, you can you can see here, there's lots of these colored illustrations all the way through, like the sort of thing that I, I suppose, you know, uh, the true fans of the series that have come with you on this epic journey so far, and there's no end in sight just at the minute, uh, <laughs> It's a huge reward for them to see all these things come to life, I guess. Yeah, we tried to really make sure that we were picking because the art was like, okay, we're limited to how many pieces we can have. Um, but we wanted to make sure that they were things that fans had been requesting, characters they'd never gotten a chance to see before and locations they'd never gotten to see. And so we really tried to be mindful of what readers had been requesting and make sure that that was what we were giving them. Um, and so, yeah, and it was, I mean, I'll admit, I was right there as the, I, you know, I'm sort of my own fangirl. It was just like, ooh, ooh, can we finally get, it, get a representation of what this character looks like? Cause I wanna see that too. So yeah, it was, it was definitely me nerding out a lot. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Uh, and getting those old scrapbooks and finding out all those things that uh, mm -hmm. you thought you would never actually make it into the book. It's awesome. Hey, uh, we're on the Better Reading Kids Facebook page and we're joined by the New York Times bestselling author, Shannon Messenger, all the way from California, sunny California today, which is exciting. Uh, it's great to have her with us and she's happy to answer all your questions. So let us know if you've got any questions. We have a few that have already come through, Shannon, so I'm going to just uh, go to them. We've got here from... Natalia. Natalia says, Shannon, what was your favorite part about writing this book? 
Um, I'm gonna assume she means writing unlocked. Um, and so um, honestly, it was just really fun getting to go into another character's POV. It was also very challenging doing that because it's just a very different way of writing the books. You know, I'm, I'm so used to just thinking about how Sophie thinks that being in um, another character's head was a little bit of like, wait, I don't know if I know how to do this. Although I, I feel like, and you can probably back me up on this. I feel like most authors, when we sit down to write our next book, we have this moment of like, what are words? How do I, how do I book today? I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to write anymore. Um, but yeah, so. <laughs> It was it was a little bit of a challenge, but once I got it, once I figured it out and I kind of got the rhythm down, it was just so much fun getting to be in that character's head. I've written one um, short story from that character before and then one kind of like little bonus scene, um, but I've never really gotten to like linger in their head for such a long piece of time. And so that was just so much fun for me um, to get to sort of really put myself in that character's shoes and 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 sort of figure out the way they think. And I, I feel like I actually, as much as I thought I knew that character super well, I feel like I learned even more about them by doing that. So it was a good little create creative exercise on top of everything. <laughs> Great, oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so we've got some more questions coming through and you can join the conversation at any time you like <laughs> and it's happy to answer your questions, but no spoilers, okay? Yeah, I get in big trouble if I give out spoilers. So don't get me in trouble, guys. <laughs> I'm not allowed. Not allowed. Shannon, uh, uh, Jackie says, Shannon, with regards to the ending, why did you do that to us? Now, we can't say what the ending is, but we can, yeah. we can extrapolate, Shannon, and say, do you like... Do you like uh, <laughs> playing with the audience in this way? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's anyone who's read the series knows that I think I, around book three, we started with the cliffhangers and then they started getting really brutal by book four. And then it's just kind of been an exercise in reader torture ever since. Yes. And I know some readers think I do that just to be evil. It's really not. It's just that this this story, there's nothing about this story that's episodic at all. And so there's no way to wrap it up at the end of a book and then go on. I have to just pick a stopping point. And so even though I, I understand that to many times to readers, it feels like I'm picking like the cruelest stopping point that I possibly can pick. What I'm really trying to pick is I try to pick what I call a game changer moment, where it's like we sort of go into the book with a question and I, I kind of wait until it feels like I've answered that question and then I'm raising something new that leaves you going, well, but what about that? And that's where we break. <laughs> and that's when the curtain falls and we go to intermission while I write as fast as I can and we get to the next book. And I do realize that it's sort of reader torture, um, but, and you know, it's funny because I experience that same pain when I read series and there's a cliffhanger and I'm just like, no! I'm good friends with um, author Amy Kaufman. I yes. think she and her new one, The Other Side of the Sky, has an evil cliffhanger at the end. I was like emailing her like, how could you do that to me? So just know I, I get to experience the pain. I do understand what I'm putting you guys through. But it's just, it's really just there's no way to wrap it up until we get to the actual end of the series. So I promise when we get to the last book, it's not going to have a cliffhanger. <laughs> but until right. then, brace for cliffhangers. <laughs> well, you heard it here first on the better <laughs> Facebook page. There's no cliffhangers at the end. Uh, so we're going to hold you to that, Shannon. <laughs> yes, at the very end, that would just be cruel. That would be, you know, I, I would have to go into hiding. So <laughs> right. well, we don't. You can ask Shannon any questions you like, uh, and she's happy to answer them. And we'll get to as many as we possibly can before we have to wrap up. And she's got a lot of a lot of words like on uh, book nine. I think it was a book eight point five. I think it's straight to book nine. Is that right, Shannon? Yeah, straight to book nine. Okay, great. Awesome. So, yeah, get your questions through. But um, before we talk a little bit more about the series, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about Shannon, uh, her, <laughs> Shannon the, the, the person, uh, because, Shannon, I have a feeling that your lead character might be based a little bit on you. Is that... <laughs> wait, so wait, wait, let's see. Uh, I don't know. I can't get the hair quite right, but, uh, you know, it's funny. Um and nobody believes me when I say this, but I honestly didn't even realize that I had made Sophie look a little bit like me until we got the first cover art. Yeah. Um, I made her blonde because, I, like I said in my very early quick pitch, I, it, the series was sort of Lord of the Rings meets X-Men. Legolas was one of my huge inspirations. And so I just kind of 
always envisioned Sophie as blonde. And then I wanted there to be something different about her appearance that um, other characters would notice and would call out. And I knew that sometimes they were gonna call it out in a way that would feel positive. And sometimes they were gonna call it out in a way that would make her feel weird or different or something. And so I was trying to find something that wouldn't, you know, end up being insulting or hurtful to any readers or anything like that because appearance is such a difficult thing. And so I sort of centered on eye color because while it's never fun to have someone make fun of your eye color, it's not the same as other things that could be made fun of. And yeah. so um, in the art that I was looking at, elves were most commonly depicted with blue eyes. And so I just thought, all right, so I'll give her brown eyes. And it didn't even cross my mind, blonde hair, brown eyes, until we got the cover art. And the, my agent's first comment when they sent it to us was, Shannon, she looks like you. And I had this moment of like, oh no, do I need to change it? Is everyone gonna think I'm the most arrogant author in the world, like creating a little mini me character and making her a hero? Like, oh no. But I had been envisioning her that way for so long that I couldn't change it. So uh, for the record, she is way, way cuter than I was at that age. Like, like right. a lot. I mean, there's, you know, a 12 year old Shannon was in the height of her awkward phase so much so that I don't ever share pictures of 12 year old Shannon because no, nobody needs to see that. It was, it was not a good phase for me. So no, I did not give the artist any photos to use for reference. Uh, it just was kind of a coincidence that that worked out. But I mean, it's a compliment now, but yeah, no, definitely not based on, on my appearance. It just kind of went those strange, oh, strange accidents. <laughs> Hey, um, the other thing I wanted to share with the audience about you is you're uh, a bit of a cat fan. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, you could probably even make the statement that I'm a, a little bit in the weird cat lady territory. <laughs> that wouldn't be inaccurate. Um, in fact, there's like two of them. You can't, you guys can't see them, but they're staring at me. And it's like, I'm just like sitting here like, be good guys. You have just a little bit more time. Don't knock anything over. I, a couple of times earlier, I was sort of waving my hands around because there was a cat down here. Yeah, I have I have three of them and they are very, very sweet, um, but they are also so much trouble. <laughs> so the orange one is Melody Pond, which is a Doctor Who okay. reference. The white one is, the one that's white with just a little bit of black is Harley Quinn. Oh. Um, and she really is the little villain of the household. Um, <laughs> she really can be quite difficult. And then that little scrappy, mostly black and little bit of white one is Gwen Stacy, which oh. is a Spider-Man reference. And she, you know, Gwen climbs everything and is everywhere. And so it's it's very, very fitting names. <laughs> oh, you've got uh, Spider-Man, Doctor Who, and uh, you've also yeah. got... Yeah, Batman references for your cats. Do, do those sorts of, are those sort of uh, pop culture uh, elements that you put into your books somehow? Yeah, you know, I have um, gotten little Batman references in quite a few times because my editor on the series was a huge, huge Batman um, <laughs> aficionado. And so whenever I could work a little Batman reference in there for her, I would. Um, and then I have always loved superheroes. Um, I, I know I've definitely gotten some Doctor Who references in there too. I'm, I'm pretty sure at one point I got an I'm so, so sorry, yeah. uh, which I was very proud of, even though I'm sure no one else has really even noticed it. I was just very excited that I got an I'm so, so sorry in. <laughs> I love it. Uh, we're on the Better Reading for Kids Facebook page. I'm chatting, I'm thrilled to be chatting with Shannon Messenger, New York Times bestselling author behind the Keeper of the Lost City series, which is all here. And the latest one, of course, is Unlocked, which is a bit of a, it's part guide to the series. It's uh, also, it's also got some, uh, a bit of a storyline in one of the other characters' point of views, which is um, a bit of a treat for the readers. So that's awesome, that. Hey, um, Shannon, the other thing I wanted to mention, in fact, you know, we've got some more questions coming through. As I was saying, uh, you can get on onto Shannon at any stage with any of your questions. We've got another one here. Uh, speaking of cats, what's your favourite animal in the series? Now, this might be uh, an animal you've made up because there's plenty of those. Um, <laughs> Or it might not be. I quite, I quite like the T Rex with the feathers. <laughs> I, you know, I love, I love Verity the T Rex, uh, T Rex, I should say. Um, yeah, she's, she's an amazing character, and it's funny because when I did that, I based the dinosaurs having feathers concept off some 
articles I'd found on the internet um, from some paleontologists speculating that dinosaurs probably had feathers. Um, but I, you know, there was no, it was sort of a, a disputed theory. No one was really buying into it. And I was just like, fluffy dinosaurs would have been the coolest. I'm making my dinosaurs feathered. Um, <laughs> and so I did. And then they have since found proof that, yep, the dinosaurs did in fact have feathers. In fact, I just got an email like last week from um, some sort of science professor at some sort of college that was reading the books and emailed me to thank me for depicting dinosaurs accurately by giving them feathers. And I was just like, I look so much smarter than I was. I really just wanted fluffy dinosaurs. <laughs> I'm just glad the universe gave that to me. Um, but so yeah, Verity's a favorite. I think probably my absolute favorite is Sylvanie the Alicorn. Um, ah, yes who is on the cover of book two and uh, actually on the cover of Unlocked, this uh, yes. beautiful creature here. And that that really was sort of an ode to 12 year old me. Um, I loved anything and everything unicorn. And the only thing that made a unicorn better was if it could fly. And so I was just like, that's it. I'm putting a flying unicorn into my books. And then I did some research and found out that they had several different name options um, that I could go with. I could have called it a pegacorn, but that sort of sounded like rotten candy. <laughs> or I could call it a unisys, which sounded like a disease. So I was like, no, not that. Or I could call it an alicorn. And so it, Sylvanie became an alicorn. And she actually is also my favorite character to write because mm -hmm. she's this kind of hyperactive, super enthusiastic, um, you know, sparkly flying horse, but she actually has these very sort of maternal moments and her and Sophie have these kind of deep discussions with like one single word. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's really kind of fun to get to find a way of sort of having them communicate on this deeper level, even though Sylvanie's vocabulary is, is quite limited and quite repetitive. <laughs> And all caps. <laughs> yes, all caps. And that, that was a fun one too, because I love all caps and exclamation marks. And it was sort of like, ha ha, copy editor, you can't make me take them out. This is her style of talking. That's fantastic. Now, let's talk to you a little bit about the writing of the actual series, because you and I have got some, we've got some similarities, which I was, I was, uh, it, which I noticed when I was looking you up a little bit. Um, <laughs> I love to draw to art when I was a kid. I think you like that too. Uh, yeah. Then I went on to study film and TV, and uh, and after that I became an author. Why did you you went on to study film and TV? Why did you decide that maybe you would take that path into becoming a uh, a writer as opposed to working as a producer behind the scenes? Um, well, you know, I had I had started out as an art major, and I got very frustrated because I felt like what came out on the page was just never as cool as what was in my head. Right. Um, and I just I kept thinking if I take more classes and I get better at it, then I will I will get better at this. And I just finally realized, no, that's just kind of a barrier for me. I'm just never really going to be able to make it as as cool on the page mm. until I had a writing class. And then finally, it was like that you know that light bulb moment, and I realized, aha, I can get people to see what I want them to see if I use words. Um, but growing up in Southern California, the class that I was taking at the time that I discovered that was a broadcast writing and production class. Right. And Hollywood sounded so glamorous and so exciting that it was just like, of course, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be a film major. And so that became my new goal. I switched majors and I, I you know, got into the number one film school in the nation and I got to Hollywood and realized, oh, wow, Hollywood is really collaborative. <laughs> really, really, really collaborative. I mean, these are multi-million dollar projects by a lot, you know, like hundreds of million dollar projects. Yeah. And so there's an entire team on the project. And it started to feel again like what was coming out on the page wasn't as cool as what was in my head because there were so many restrictions. I know some people, I could see it in film school, some people really thrived in that collaborative process. But for me, it ended up just kind of really making me frustrated and 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 really you know kind of reducing the quality of my work and so i realized that that wasn't the right path either and then i but i was like but i love writing and then you know sort of another light bulb moment, hey there's those book things <laughs> I, I could try writing those and they're perfect for control freaks who uh don't want to have to collaborate because we can write them by ourselves it's amazing <laughs> And then once you get into the business, you realize there's editors and publishers and they all have opinions and you have to collaborate anyways. <laughs> it's very true. Although I, I feel like in that sense, it's a little bit different because they really do sort of 
they're just trying to help you bring out your own vision. I, I, I've heard someone smarter than me who I can't remember their name say that the best editor is an editor who helps you to write the book you thought you wrote the first time. Um, and, you know, I always feel like that's sort of been my experience in working with both my agent, my editors and anyone who's helped me with the projects. It's like when they call something out, it's it's usually my reaction is immediately. Oh, yeah, they're totally right. You know, even if even if I don't love their suggestion for how to fix it, it's the problem that they identify is always like, yeah, that they are right. <laughs> they are definitely right. This I, I totally messed that up. I need to fix that. So um, it, it really has been a good kind of collaboration. Whereas in films, so many of the times that you're having to make changes, it's just because, again, it's such a beast, you know, it's like, oh, well, the actor's only available these days, so we have to reduce the number of scenes that they're in so that they can only be in these scenes and just so many things that was like, but it would have been so much better <laughs> if we didn't have all of these complications. So it was, it was just not quite for me. Well, that's why we need a Keeper of the Lost Cities uh, franchise because uh, then we'll we'll put you at the helm. You can direct it. You can star as Sophie. We'll use some sort of uh, CGI and it'll be an absolute blockbuster and you won't have to answer to anyone. No one wants my acting skills. Trust me. That is That would not be, uh, uh, you know, my, my gift to the universe will be not trying to uh, do that. <laughs> All right. We'll take that under advisement. Uh, we've got... <laughs> here who is a budding actor but more importantly she writes new york times best-selling series including this fabulous series which i am just loving and so are my daughters it's uh the uh keeper of the lost cities and it's terrific and the latest one is book 8.5 which is unlocked which is also terrific and a reward for all those fans now it is as i said before it's like a well now if you count this as a full book even though it's 0.5 it's a nine book series did you sit down when you started and thought, I'm going to write a nine book series? Or did you, when you first wrote the, the, you came up with the idea, did you think it was going to be something a little bit more, well, shall we say shorter? <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, I did know that I was dealing with a huge, huge story. In fact, when the story first came to me, I sort of had that moment of like, okay, so we're going to put that on the back burner because this is the first book that I've ever sat down to write after all my screenwriting training. And how about we don't start the, you know, an epic series. Um, but I could just tell because the problem was so huge because Sophie's not just battling a villain. Um, she's, she's dealing with the fact that her entire world is flawed. And I've, I've always called the world of the lost cities sort of a crumbling utopia. Um, oh, yeah. It looks very wonderful and magical and perfect. And there's a lot about it that really is wonderful and magical and awesome, but it has a lot of problems. And so there's these sort of rebellions that are going on in a reaction to that. And so sometimes the good guys are, you know, on the exact same page as the bad guys because they're both reacting to the same thing. They just have completely different solutions yeah. to the problems. The bad guys are sort of like, let's burn it all down and start again. And the good guys are like, no, no, how about we don't? <laughs> so, um, but it, it, it's a huge problem. And I, and so I knew I was looking at, you know, nine, 10 books and it was really when we went to, when, once I had an agent and we went to shop the series and I kind of told her that now I could see this being like eight, nine, 10 books. And she was just like, Okay, so we need to talk about the realities of publishing. <laughs> Janet, you're a debut author. No one's gonna buy 10 books from you. I mean, it would have been nice, but I got very lucky that they were even willing to buy three. And then it was kind of like, we had to wait and see from there how the series would do. And so at first I was a little bit like, but how am I going to do that? And then I realized that I had a lot of villains and so the easiest way to sort of break up the different arcs of the series was to just hold back on the villains until I knew how many books I was going to get to have. And so that's why the first three sort of only have a couple of villains and then we get a couple more in the next four and five and then we definitely get some more in six, seven and eight. And so everyone sort of wondered like, had I just been, you know, making up new villains to stretch out the series? And it's like, no, I was planning those all along. I just, because of the way publishing worked, it was like, first it was going to be three, and then they bought a fourth book and said, we'll probably be able to buy a fifth book. But it, I mean, it, publishing's a business, you know? And so we had to kind of wait. And then at, at when they bought book five, they had kind of said, many series, Shannon, are five books. And I just got very lucky that book five was the one that hit the New York Times list and the series had really started to get legs under it. And so they said, you can keep going. <laughs> and so then we had, you know, 
book six and seven. And by then they were just like, however many you want. And so now I'm in this really nice position where I'm getting to let the story sort of dictate how many books there will be instead of having to arbitrarily say, there will be this many. I'm sort of trying to time it out so that, you know, I think we've all read series where the last book felt a little bit rushed. Mm. Um, or I think we've all read series where the last book felt a little stretched out. And I think that often happens because of the way publishing is that an author was, you know, sort of forced to commit to X number of books and that was it. So it's been really nice that my publisher is now willing to trust me <laughs> and say, okay, just let us know if you need to add another one or not. And we, we're just kind of going from there and, and letting the, the shape of the story sort of dictate how many there will be. So right now that's all I have under contract is book nine. That's what I'm writing. And whether there will be a book 10 or not is still sort of TBD because I'm still writing book nine. I have a feeling there probably will be just because I, I feel like my job as an author is to answer all the questions that I've raised by the end of the series. And there's still a lot of answers I owe my readers. So I, I'm not sure that I can really cram them all into book nine. Um, but for right now, that's just where we're at because I wanna make sure that I end on a high instead of having it either be rushed or stretched, so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that's great. That's great to hear that you can end it on your own terms. I think that's fantastic. So we're gonna get a great ending to this series at some stage, it might not be soon, but uh, it could be, who knows? I'm not sure. No pressure, right? <laughs> Hey, Shannon, um, it's been great to talk to you now. Um, or if anyone has any questions for Shannon, we've just got a couple more minutes left and, and we'll get to as many as we can. But um, before you go, I wanted to ask you about the elf world that you've created in this series. And there's some pretty cool powers and pretty cool aspects to it, like how the fact that the elves have all different sort of powers or they have a birth fund where they get like stacks of money when they're born <laughs> and they can do what they like with it. I wish, I wish we had that. That would um, be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> around on light beams uh which is which are, all these things are, are great and obviously kids just it, their imaginations just literally light up when they <laughs> when they uh read these things but i wanted to ask you specifically about the first aspect the elf powers if you could have one of the powers of these elves in your series which one would you choose you know um it's funny because my answer to this question always used to be um teleporting because oh, yeah. I, I, while they're able to light leap, um, and and I, so I get some people who are like, why would you want to be a teleporter when you can kind of do the same thing by light leaping? And it's like, yes, but light leaping requires a lot of concentration. And I'm kind of like the dog on up, you know, I'm kind of squirrel, you know, so I'm pretty sure if I tried light leaping, it would not go well. And so um, I used to say teleporting because, you know, I would love to be able to go places like Australia and, and all over the world without having to get on a plane for 17 hours and deal with airport security. Now with the whole COVID situation, that answer feels a little bit, you know, like maybe I should be staying put right now and not teleporting. So I would also absolutely love to be a technopath, um, mostly because technology hates me. I'm one of those people that's like, someone please make my phone do what it needs to do because it won't do it for me. So it would be great to be a technopath and actually have technology cooperate. Um, I, 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 that would be priceless. <laughs> a technopath, how cool is that? Hey, Shannon, thank you so much for joining us today on the Better Reading Kids Facebook page. We love the series, it's the Keeper of the Lost City series, and it's a New York Times best-selling hit. And the latest book, of course, as we saw before, is called Unlocked. And it's sort of like a little bit of a guide to some of those some of those bits and pieces that the the larger world that you've created, which which um, you haven't been able to get as much of a glimpse at in the first eight books. So have a look at this one, and you'll find out even more about the Keeper of the Lost City's world. It's unlocked and it's fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us uh, today, Shannon, and best of luck with the rest of the series and including Unlocked. <laughs> thank you. And this has been so much fun. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in or anyone who watches the replay. And um, just this has been so much fun getting to chat with you. And I'm so jealous of your accent, I must say. It's it's just, you know, I could listen to you read the phone book, you know, <laughs> the Australian accent is wonderful. So thank you for letting me enjoy that and bask in while simultaneously cringing at my own lovely um, American accent. <laughs> Not at all. I have never been complimented on my accent before. So thank you very much, Shannon. That's very nice to be and we hope that at some point you do come to Australia, whether you light leap or not, that's totally up to you, but we'd love to see you at some stage. 
I would love to, to hopefully when the world goes back to normal, we can make this happen because that is definitely, definitely on my bucket list. So awesome. <laughs> thank you, Shannon. Uh, we'll talk again sometime soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.